Um, thanks and welcome to my talk on uh, analyzing the security of satellite-based air traffic control. My name is Martin Schromeyer. Uh, I work at the Cyber Defense Campus, with, which is uh, part of the procurement agency and part of the Swiss Department of Defense. So DEFCON has, and, and other conferences, has a long range of talks about attacks on air traffic control. It's obviously an interesting critical infrastructure. Um, if you are able to attack something, could have potentially catastrophic consequences. This is an, an overview of uh, typical technologies, communications, protocols that are being used by uh, commercial and, and aircraft and other aircraft uh, in flight. Uh, and basically, since around the early 2010s, a lot of practical attacks on pretty much all of these uh, communication technologies in aviation have been shown and demonstrated. The principle is always the same. Uh, you examine these standards, aviation standards, they are known, they're available, uh, there's no security, no authentication in them. You implement them, you build a receiver, these might also be useful for enthusiasts, plane spotters, uh, that's stuff powers flight radar or flight aware. Uh, but from a security perspective, if you have a receiver, it's also not difficult to implement a sender or a transmitter using software defined radios. And when you do that, you can do security analysis and you profit. And that's something that has been done for all of these technologies, whether it's aircraft, aircraft, aircraft ground, or um, also GPS is well known. And since they all have no security built in, it's not difficult to attack them, it's quite obvious. But a few technologies uh, nicely fitting in with the aerospace topic have come up uh, over the past decade or so where aircraft are talking to satellites uh, and kind of trying to replace some of these technologies or at least enhance them. So that's what this talk will be about. Just a quick teaser. Um, my colleagues uh, will have a talk tomorrow uh, on Creative Stage 2 attacking the collision avoidance system. So that was one of the last technologies that hadn't been demonstrated uh, from this whole overview. So uh, tomorrow, 1415, that's your opportunity to see a, a real attack on this as well. But this talk is about space-based air traffic control. So what do we understand under that? Uh, there's two different technologies actually. Uh, one I'll touch on briefly and one more in detail. First one is satellite ADS-B and the second one is the so-called ADS-C or ADS contract. So let's look at that. Satellite ADS-B, um, you all probably have heard of these ADS-B attacks. Uh, there has been, have been talks since the 2010s. People like Renderman have had main stage talks uh, demonstrating the problem here. It's well known to be vulnerable. The terrestrial transponder technology, aircraft sending data to the ground, trivial to receive, send ghost aircraft, uh, everything is possible. The problem is space based ADSB is essentially just the same. Uh, some companies have built constellations in low Earth orbit and they're simply picking up these same terrestrial signals and then giving them to air navigation service providers to air traffic control. That is obviously helpful where you don't have terrestrial receivers, so over the oceans or in mountainous areas. One of these uh, providers, Arion, also on the homepage, they say, yeah, it's just ADS-B. There's nothing else here. What they, however, also said uh, when they went why, um, when they went widely um, public with it, said, okay, we're 40, uh, 485 miles up in space. So you can't attack that. It's not like somebody is attacking that signal. They could attack GPS which they can and obviously is a widespread problem in particular over the past year now, but they're not going to attack the actual terrestrial ADS-B signal. 500 miles up in space, too far away. And at the time we already thought 
honestly, that's bullshit. It's just an engineering problem. Just uh, you need more power. You can do just the same. They pick up the signals from aircraft flying 30,000 feet, 10 kilometers. Um, they pick that up in space, right? So what's 10 kilometers more f sending from the ground? It's not a problem, quite obviously. And uh, yes, space is quite obviously not inherently secure. We've seen this last year, um, latest last year here at Hackerset. Uh, of course, you can communicate with satellites, even two-way, and attack them. I think there's, there's no doubt about this. Um, and yeah, back, back then at least we postulated a theoretic attack. We didn't actually send to their satellites. Um, would not be legal. But we said, hey, here, these are kind of the requirements that you have to think about. Um, relation, position relation to the aircraft and the satellites. And then you can simply send ghost aircraft also to these satellites. Not a problem. So very much possible. We haven't done it in practice for regulatory reasons, but uh, it's certainly not secure. There's no reason to believe so. That brings me to the second technology, ADSC, which is much less well known, I would say. Uh, it's been developed already late 90s, but only become quite popular over the past five or 10 years. Also in the wake of the MH370 incident, uh, tracking aircraft over oceans has become quite a popular topic. So what this ADSC or full name automatic dependent surveillance contract actually do? Well, it picks up aircraft information and sends it to air traffic service units, they call it, which is basically ground stations. Uh, there are dozens or even hundreds around the world. And this information includes aircraft position, altitude, speed, navigational intent, meteorological data. And of course, this is all very useful for air traffic control, air traffic surveillance, uh, route monitoring in particular if you're over the Atlantic or Pacific and have no updates from your aircraft and where they are. This is roughly the setup. Um, aircraft gets their position, of course, also from GNSS, GPS services. Um, it then connects to different types of satellites, typically geostationary satellites from Enmasat, but it can also be actually uh, LEO constellations also offer these services. And then the satellites forward the data to the ground and there is being routed to the um, air navigation service provider who require that content. There's also VHF, HF version of all of this, but uh, that's not what we're looking at here. What's the purpose? Um, I think I alluded to it. Uh, goal is really to enable aircraft monitoring in very remote areas. We don't have terrestrial surveillance of aircraft. If you do that, if you know where the aircraft are, rather than just uh, roughly estimating from, you know, leaving US mainland towards Europe. After two hours, you might not really know where they are anymore. Uh, if you know where they are, you can more efficiently utilize the airspace because you can minimize separation between different aircraft. And the second effect, um, you reduce the reliance on traditional voice communication between pilots and controllers. These channels are quite congested, quite busy, and you can, like this, if you put a lot of the data on these digital satellite channels, you can use these uh, for more urgent correspondence. This is roughly a comparison. Um, this is an image from ASB Exchange, and it shows roughly where you can have crowdsourced terrestrial reception of aircraft signals. So by and large, that's where a lot of people live and also a lot of, let's say, more wealthy people live who can put up receivers on the ground and feed it to these systems. All of the red areas, you will never have any, any reception, any surveillance of aircraft. 
So if we overlay this with ADSC coverage, we can see that uh, this sort of satellite coverage fills in a lot of the, the red gaps, uh, certainly Pacific, Atlantic, um, even Indian Ocean, and also partly you can see over, over Africa and some other terrestrial areas. So how does ADC actually work? Um, let's look first at uplink and then at downlink messages. Basically, Atrophy Controller, they initiate the connection always. So they request a certain aircraft that's flying um, to provide them with a so-called contract that can either be periodic um, with that sort of periodic contract, you maybe get regular updates every 10 minutes or so of position, altitude, and the other information they want, or they can ask for certain events. Uh, so, for example, when uh, they want a waypoint change, so an aircraft is flying toward a certain waypoint, and they know that, and they can request um, a change of that waypoint through these contracts. That's roughly how the message is looking, um, but we won't get into detail here. And then we have the probably more interesting downlink part. So this is where the aircraft answers with ADSC reports, um, which go to the atrophy control uh, service provider. The aircraft sends, as I said, for example, periodic updates, uh, position everything every 10 minutes, or in these events, uh, if change events, cases, uh, it sends certain reports regarding that. Again, that's what the messages look like. They will include position, latitude, longitude, altitude, some timestamp, and then depending on the type of the report, it will include some more information. So why is all that important? I slightly alluded to this already. Uh, if we don't have this kind of new modern technology, the atrophy controllers will have to rely on pre-computed aircraft trajectories, roughly guesstimating where the aircraft is, which is not so great for surveillance, and they will use the voice communication just the same, finding out where the aircraft is and what they're doing, um, in particular in remote areas, using HF and the likes, and that's not the most precise technology or the most available one. So, in short, ADC is very crucial for aircraft monitoring in these areas. It's being rolled out, as we've seen on the, on the map, quite a lot of commercial aircraft have it now and use it. And in contrast to many of the other technologies that were in the earlier slides, this hasn't been studied at all. Uh, not in terms of use cases, really, in, in the scientific community, but also uh, in, in the security community in terms of, well, what can we do with it? What, what can we do against it? So, what about security? Uh, there is a paper on this, on what I'm going to say. So, uh, we talked about this at this year's uh, SpaceSeg workshop already. But if you, if, you wanna, if you prefer it in written form, you can look it up. Um, but I cover most of this in the following slides. So, that's our system model and our threat model. Basically, we have the satellite in the middle, we have the ground earth station, as they call it, and we have the aircraft earth station, which might sound a bit weird, but, uh, you know, aircraft is still on the earth while a satellite is not, so that's why they call it that way. Um, different frequencies that we have to look at, so the aircraft uh, uses the 1.6 gigahertz frequency to talk to the satellite, and then there's a different up and down in frequency from the satellite to the ground station, uh, 3.6 gigahertz and 6.5 gigahertz. And we have three different types of attackers that we consider. First one is a passive attacker. You could also call it an eavesdropper. Um, the eavesdropper simply needs to be in range of the whole satellite beam of the geostationary satellite. So that's not very complicated. Um, we have realized that at least in Europe, you need to be in a 5G free zone to listen to the downlink because the 3.6 gigahertz area uh, frequency is exactly, at least in Europe, the 5G frequency uh, or one of the 5G frequencies. And if you have one of these transmitters, ground stations nearby, 
you will not be able to receive the very weak satellite signals. So that was an issue that we had to contend with. Um, then we have two active attackers. One is attacking the downlink, so basically transmitting the same data as we see on the downlink uh, towards the Earth station. Uh, and an uplink attacker, so somebody who sends to the satellite, which is more complicated, absolutely. Uh, you need more power. And we've been speaking to some experts, depending on the satellite setup, there may be some beamforming going on, so you might it might not be sufficient to stay in just anywhere in the satellite beam. You may also need to be close to a ground station, depending on the satellite setup. So let's go through it one by one. What can we do with eavesdropping on ADC messages? The content uh, we've seen is mostly position, waypoints. Uh, there's some meta information such as the aircraft ID, I some identifiers, uh, and mostly this is use or useful for reconnaissance, reconnaissance on aircraft. So you know where they are, you know what they sent, you know where they're going. That is quite nice. Um, can be used for attacks on aircraft, also on other protocols, or for active attacks on ADC itself. We can link these identifiers to databases that are available online. Uh, and then from there, you may imagine a lot of privacy violations. I'm sure you've seen all the kerfuffle about people uh, tracking Elon Musk or Taylor Swift's aircraft, right? Uh, if you haven't, then I can recommend my talk uh, The Village last year. Uh, I think it's just been put online last week, so you can find it on YouTube. Uh, let's move on towards the active um, attacks, first on the uplink. And here, mostly what you can do is different sorts of denial of service attacks. So if we look at the protocol here, um, the aircraft locks on, it will be confirmed, it will be acknowledged. And of course, if you attack this handshake, then you might uh, simply be able to prevent the lock on, and then there is no ADSC connection. That's, yeah, it's a denial of service of ADSC. You have other technologies available, of course, so it's not immediately safety relevant at all, but it's certainly an attack. And there are several places in the protocol where you can do this. On the downlink end, uh, it gets a bit more interesting. Here, you can do spoofing of aircraft positions towards the, or, yeah, towards the atrophy control provider. What you can't do, just to preface this, um, is to inject ghost aircraft. Why? Because, we, as we've seen earlier, the atrophy controller always initiates the connection to an aircraft. So they will do that towards an aircraft they know is already flying, and uh, if they get a response, okay, great. But uh, if they get a response from an aircraft they haven't initiated a connection with, it will just be discarded and ignored. If, however, they already have a connection, then it's absolutely possible to send different positions than the one from the aircraft. Um, and we've illustrated this here with our own setup. So on the left, we have real aircraft uh, positions that we received. And you can just send, you know, for the same aircraft, 10 positions clustering together, and it would be displayed this way. Likewise, uh, you can flood ground stations with emergency mode messages from basically all the existing aircraft that they have a contract with. That's the picture of the flight management system here. That's where the pilot can put this on. And then, of course, they will be flagged with the atrophy controller and uh, get priority, get certain routines set up. And here you can basically do this for all the aircraft at the same time, which would again be causing some, some chaos and some denial of service. We've done some real world evaluation as far as uh, that is legally possible. Um, that's our receiver setup. So we have both set up um, downlink and uplink receivers. The pipelines for the receivers are available online on GitHub 
um, have it in a later slide, but mostly you can download it, put it uh, together with your software defined radios and antennas. Then you have to look, follow tutorials, look at the channels, and you can receive the data. You have to look, check also which satellite is in your area. So this is the NMASAT coverage of the uh, geo satellites. So for us, it would be the AlphaSat. If we look at it in Europe, in the US, you would get different satellites and their aircraft connections. That's the pipeline, the setup. Um, definitely credit to all these people who have written the super interesting, super useful uh, receiver software, SDR receiver, Jero, and a lot of tutorials. You set the whole thing up, save the data, and analyze it. That's what we did. That's how these uh, setups look like. The uplink, much easier, as you see, can be a super small antenna on the left. For the downlink, you need something in the uh, eight, eight feet dish size. So uh, your your house might be, a, you, you might have a, to have a decent sized garden for this. Some data insights. Uh, we just looked at this for a few weeks, uh, collected a lot of messages. You see the black points, which are the positions here, 2,500 aircraft. Um, communicating with uh, 50 or 60 ground stations. If you want to see more on this, other people are collecting the data as well. So tbgframes.io, you always get the last two days. Um, these are typical uh, routes that you can follow with that setup. Then, as I've mentioned, we reversed it, we built a transmitter, and it works. It's straightforward student work, uh, building a transmitter from a receiver from all of these existing um, SDR implementations. We tested it. It's fairly binary. We set up our own ground station. We tested the transmitter. Can generate arbitrary messages on ADSC, including all of the sublayers. So we injected these, these messages into our dish, into our ground stations. And lo and behold, it works. So if you have a receiver software in ADSC, you can simply inject any legitimately looking message and you cannot tell it apart from the messages that we get from an aircraft. That brings me to the conclusion of my talk today. Um, I hope I could explain that satellite air traffic control certainly helps increase airspace efficiency in many areas. Unfortunately, security was never a concern. There's no authentication, which is as problematic in space as on the ground. Passive attackers can eavesdrop and follow aircraft and do whatever what may, they might find interesting with it. And uh, you can follow a lot of aircraft just with a single receiver, which is nice. Uh, active attackers can inject signals and disrupt air traffic control to a certain extent. And the resources certainly are quite straightforward or trivial. So it's uh, basically a master thesis here. Student can do this and uh, set up costs for the transmitters are a few hundred euros. So uh, not a problem. That's it for me. Just another teaser. Uh, we have some, if you're interested in injection of signals into satellite dishes, uh, there's also a talk on the DEF CON main stage uh, tomorrow, track three, breaking the beam at 2.15. And uh, next week at Usenex Security, the paper is online under this link. So just I hope I could do this as well. Thank you.